Why am I crying? <laughs> Why the heck am I crying? Hi folks, it's Father Columba. I've moved, this is me in Limerick. I brought someone with me. It's not really the real him. Well, it's part of him. It's actually two of part of him. Guess who this is? This is Jerry, the geranium. Hello, Jerry, how are you? That's the new place. Uh, what do we want to talk about today? I want to talk to you about the intercession of the saints. It's a declaration that actually Catholics are bound to believe, a declaration that this person is in heaven. It's one of the highest levels of teaching, actually. It's when it declares this person, we've done a massive, and I mean a massive discernment on these. So at least how they do it um, for I don't know how many hundred years. They really, really discern this well. It's not just some quick, I know we'll have a quick. Do you, do you seem like a good, yeah, yeah, they're in heaven. No, when the church de declares something like that, they really take time and years. One of the biggest proofs that's required is not just that this person lived an exceptionally holy life and exhibited uh, what's called heroic virtue, but also that um, they have worked miracles post-mortem. Because when you work a miracle pre-mortem, <laughs> when you're alive, you know, when you pray and God answers your prayer, well, that's often the work of a charism, and a charism is separate from your holiness. And that's another talk. So somebody who isn't even in the state of grace, they can be used by God to work charism, a, he a healing, a miracle, like crazy, crazy miracle, all sorts of things. God can work through anybody, can't he? He can. He can give dreams and visions to evil people, <laughs> full on evil people. And there you go. There's loads of biblical basis for that. Anyway, so the church requires post-mortem miracles. So if this person is dead, there has to be like this, it, there, you can't argue against the fact that this person like a miracle happened and there's no explanation. Nobody else was praying in this way for this. And it's just directly connectable, unarguably connectable to this person. Plus it's not something that like cancer is, that doesn't really cover the miracle because people can, can spontaneously go in remission, you know? So it has to be something that's like, no, this could not have happened. This is a full on biological or whatever miracle. So big deal when the church declares someone to be a saint. Okay, so we have all of these people who are officially declared saints. They've been massive in my life, reading the lives of, of the heroes uh, who have gone before us, the cloud of witnesses. My conversion happened uh, through reading the diary of St. Faustina. I would read it and I would start to weep and I didn't know why. I, a lot of the stuff that she said, I didn't like all that suffering stuff. I'm like, no, thanks very much. Why am I crying? <laughs> why the heck am I crying? Because the grace of God was slam dunking me. And I was reading all these other pagan stuff, and New Age stuff and all sorts of things, cult things, started touching into some Wicca stuff. And it was fascinating. And there was all these powers promised and none of it made me cry. Only this little nun who died in her 30s, I think she was 33. She had a really tough life and she loved Jesus. And Jesus loved her. And uh, he would apparently appear to her and talk to her. And when I would read it, the Holy Spirit would convict me. And it gave, gave me the hunger to ask him if he was real, which led me to ta -da, today. So I'm just so, so grateful for my very, very close and wonderful friend, I think Faustina Maria Kowalska. And it was really weird because I used to know her when she was blessed, which is one of the earlier stages in the process of the church's discernment. So she was blessed Faustina. And it was weird when she became declared Saint Faustina, it was like, like a friend changing their name. What? <laughs> but it just goes to show of like how dear she was and is to me. And I have many, many other saints who are dear friends. Saint Therese, of course, uh, of Lisieux. Uh, Saint Francis, Saint Padre Pio, Saint Philip Neri. Oh my gosh, Saint Philip Neri. And these are all folks I ask for their prayers every day. And I, I can do that with total, total chill. I'm not worried at all. <laughs> I'm like, this is sound doctrine. This is safe as houses, safer. This is God's family and I'm asking them to, to pray for me. And they, they show up all the time in answering prayers, bringing me closer to Jesus over and over and over again, bringing me closer to Jesus. So I want to tell you just one last story of someone who hasn't been declared a saint, but I just experienced this recently and it blew me away. And it's this fella. Ta-da. I don't know if you can see that. Ta-da! That's going to be nice and fuzzy. That's, this is Father Benedict Rochelle. He's one of the founders of my community, the Franciscans of the Renewal. This is a shameless plug right now. <laughs> Father Benedict was an amazing man. He was on EWTN, the Catholic TV station, for years. Hilarious. One of the funniest guys I ever knew. Absolutely 
100% hilarious. And he was also one of the most brilliant people I knew. He had a photographic memory. He would just look up and start quoting St. Augustine passages. Just and he said he could just, he just read them in his mind. Uh, he died. He died back in 2013, 2014, 2013. He died on the eve, the vigil of the Feast of St. Francis. So that's pretty cool. So one friend of mine, uh, she was looking for a house, a single mom. She needed to move and, you know, couldn't get anywhere because she's a single mom and she wasn't working full time. Uh, just super hard. So that night she was at this event where we were commemorating St. Francis when we get word that Father Benedict uh, had died. So she is praying and she decides, you know what, I'm going to ask St. Francis. And she also threw in Father Benedict. I'm also going to ask Father Benedict to sort me out with the house. And the next morning she gets a phone call from a guy who wants to give her, specifically wants to give her the house. Now she had to pay, you know, there was, there was rent. It was beautiful home, perfect, great location, all she needed, everything she needed. And she had told me and the friars, you know, it was, it was Father Benedict. She was really, really convinced. I mean, Francis was in there too. Anyway, fast forward. I, and at the time I'm like, oh, okay, okay, fair enough, yeah, yeah, cool. But I didn't take it too seriously. But then just recently, I have uh, two friends, very dear friends, and they were living in Bradford. They were friends of mine there in Bradford and they really wanted to move. They wanted to move for like years, but particularly in the last what, year and a half, maybe two years, they were just talking about it all the time. I was praying with them for it all the time and nothing so hard, right, to get housing. So hard nobody would take them on. So I was just about to leave Bradford. They came over and, you know, we were just saying goodbye. And again, they, they asked for prayers for this. They're just so, they're so kind of upset and concerned and discouraged and whatever, you know. And they're, these aren't Catholics. They're, they're, in fact, one of them's not even Christian. <laughs> so I prayed with them, asked the Lord to bless them and help, help them find a house. And then just before you're we finished, the thought, I remembered this story about Father Benedict. I'm like, oh, and there was actually a picture just like this one. It was a little card there in the room. So I told him the story. I said, listen, Father Benedict, he had an amazing heart for those in need, he had an amazing heart for the poor. And he would do anything in that sort of situation. He would move heaven and earth to sort that sort of situation out. So I just told him a bit about it. We said a little prayer. To, we just asked him to pray to God for this situation. Would you ever find that house? Come on. And I had so much faith. I had so much confidence. I'm like, oh, I think he's going to do something. They went home. They took the card. They were praying and they asked him again, same thing again themselves. The next morning, the next morning, they get an email. They have a house. Case closed. Thanks very much. I had been praying for them, for, with, with them, to Jesus for a year and a half. And Jesus was like, no. Until we asked Father Benedict. Father Benedict asked and Jesus said, I will give you a house. The next morning. So I got an email off them. I had gone off wherever I was going off to. I get an email and they said, we got an email that morning. And a guy said, yeah, you can have the, you can have the house. And it was a house in London. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Anyway, so I just say that because it, guys, it's real. There are giants of intercession in heaven. Giants. They would get miracles answered that would terrify you. And they're waiting for you to ask. And what you'll find is there's certain saints that you'll hear their story and it will so speak to your heart. It will like particularly speak to your heart. And that for me is a real sign. Oh, that's not just I'm interested in them, but actually they're interested in me. And they have like, yeah, they're, they're like, oh, this one, I'm going to, I'm going to help this one. And there's certain saints who kind of walked with me like St. Faustina. Yeah. So um, have at it. Read some books, Lives of Saints. Uh, get yourself a thing or look online, um, whatever it is, you'll hear about one. Or just ask the Lord, Lord, is there a particular saint that you want me to have a devotion to, that you want me to learn from, that, 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 has, uh, that, that wants to bless me? Just ask Jesus and he'll lead you to them. That's grand. That's it. There you go, lads. Hope that's fun. That was way too long. Good luck, editors. Enjoy that one. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys.